I was doing deliveries for Uber until a few years ago, and this is the worst thing that ever happened to me on the job. I live in a town of about 30,000 people, but there's a bigger city not that far away. I would sometimes go to the bigger city to work if it was going to be a longer shift, or I could work in my town if it was going to be for a shorter time. At the busiest hours, though, there was always work in my town. In between the two towns, it was just one long highway lined with farms. I was out one night on a Saturday, and I was in the larger city. I had been working since 4 in the afternoon, and it was almost midnight, so I was only interested in a few more deliveries before calling it a night. Eventually one came in, for a spot that looked on the map like it was for a farm in the country. Normally I would not go so far out, but it was actually on my way home, so I accepted. I picked up the food, and then began driving out of the city. The night was dark, but the highway was well lit, being that it was the main road for that community. There were only two lanes in total, one for each direction. Then at the sides it was either fields or trees, as far as you could see, and at the side of the road there was a deep ditch. I always remember thinking that if I ended up in one of those ditches, then I would not be able to get out. Every mile or two, there would be a turn off for one of the dirt roads, some of which were just the driveways for farms, while others led further into the country. Based on my map, I had to take one of those turn offs, so I was keeping a close eye to make sure that I didn't go past. When the turn came close, I slowed my car and made the move. The dirt road was dark as soon as I made it a few hundred feet from the highway. I was watching the map the whole time, because the turns were not obvious in the dark. Before long, I saw a house in the distance with the lights on. I was pretty sure it was my destination, because it looked like it on the map. Sure enough, my phone led me right there. As soon as I pulled up to the house, I noticed several large signs that said no trespassing. It looked kind of intimidating, like it was some kind of paranoid guy who was shooting intruders on sight. Can't blame him completely, because privacy is important, but I was a little uneasy driving up to the house. When I got close, I could see the lights on in the front room, and there was a person looking out the window. I shut off my car, and then got out with the food in my hand. And as soon as I took two steps towards the house, a man burst out the front door. He was in his fifties, wearing a light grey t-shirt and shorts. I didn't notice it right away, but after he took a few more steps towards me, I saw that he was holding a rifle. At that moment, I still thought it was just my customer, even though I was a little uncomfortable. After another four or five steps, the man raised the gun and pointed it towards me. I froze in place and dropped the bag right then. I put my hands over my head and didn't know what to say. We stood there in silence for what felt like a long time, but probably only 15 or 20 seconds. That was when the man spoke for the first time. I ought to put you out right here, the man said. I had nothing in response, so I just stood there. Then I heard something click in the gun. I think he was either cocking it back or maybe switching off the safety. I don't know much about guns, so I'm not that sure. All I know is that at that moment, I was pretty sure I was going to die. Eventually, I managed to blurt out my explanation. I told him I was doing a delivery and that this was the address I was given. He said he didn't order anything and told me to get out of there. I didn't waste any time and got back into my car. All the while, he was still pointing the gun at me, following me with it as I went. As I was sitting in the driver's seat, I dropped my keys to the floor of my car. I was shaking badly by then, so I think that's understandable. When I bent down to get them, I heard a loud bang that could have only been a gunshot. Thinking he was opening fire on me, I kept my head down and stayed out of sight. I stayed down there for a solid minute when I heard him yell, get the hell out of here, or something like that. That was when I looked up and saw that there was no bullet hole in any of my windows. He must have shot up in the air. Still terrified, I sat up and managed to get my keys into the ignition. Then I backed out of there and made it back to the dark road. Once I was back to the main highway, I called the cops, but they couldn't do anything. When they talked to the man, he denied making any order. Because of that, I was technically trespassing and they had to leave him alone. He denied firing a shot though. After that, I was pretty sure the order was fake and the police confirmed that because it was placed with a credit card that was reported stolen. I think I was the victim of a sick prank. Whether the pranksters knew where they sent me is still uncertain. Maybe they knew there was some crazy guy who lived there and they were trying to get me killed. I still don't know if that was a coincidence or not, but I survived, although I was pretty sure I was going to die at the time. This happened in the summer a few years back. I live in a spot where there are a lot of good camping places nearby. I never go to the established campgrounds, 
Instead, I like to use public land, because it's more like a real adventure. Not that I go that far into the wilderness or anything, but it is a step up from paid campsites. I usually go with friends, but sometimes I just head out for the weekend with my dog Clancy. I think she enjoys it even more than I do. This is about a time when it was just me and her. I decided to take a trip up to a spot where I had been before. My friends and I went out earlier in the year, stayed at a spot right near a small creek in the mountains. There were a lot of bears around there, but they had never been a problem before. I had seen them, but they always left me alone. I think having a dog helps for some reason. Maybe the bears are scared. We left after I was done work on a Friday. The plan was to get there just before dark and set up quickly, and we would have all day on Saturday to hang out. I parked at a small clearing at the front of the trail, and there were no other cars there, even though that was the only official parking spot for a long way. Clancy got out, basically jumping for joy like she couldn't wait to hit the trail. I wasn't as excited, but also happy to be out of the city. I was expecting less than an hour hike to our spot, and not surprisingly, there was nobody else around. I set up the tent first, and then put my folding chair by the fire pit, which was still there from before. I got a fire going just as the sun was setting, and then I realized that I hadn't seen Clancy in a while. I called out for her, and within a few seconds she came running, so everything was fine. We sat around the fire for about an hour, and it was completely dark. Then I started to hear some noises from the woods. It was just footsteps and twigs snapping, but it sounded big. Not like a deer, because they walk very lightly. At the moment, I thought it was a bear, but Clancy would have been freaking out if it was. She can sense them ahead of time, probably from the smell, but she was silent, and the footsteps were getting closer. I took out my flashlight and waved it around for a minute, but it did nothing. The bush was way too thick, and I couldn't see anything. It stopped for a while, so I convinced myself that it was nothing. Another half hour went by, and then it started again. This time when I took out my light, I saw a man walking towards me from the tree line. I was creeped out right away, but tried to hide it because it could have been nothing to worry about. One thing that did comfort me was that Clancy seemed relaxed. As he approached me though, I thought he looked creepy. He was a tall man with thin shoulder length dark hair flowing out from a winter hat. The man walked right up next to me, my flashlight still shining in his face. When he got close, I put my light down because the fire was enough to see. I got up ready to talk to him, but before either of us said a word, the man pulled a knife on me. I stumbled back and tripped over my chair, but managed to save myself from falling, then I ran back a bit. I looked back and the man was still around my fire. Clancy was keeping some distance, but she was barking at him ferociously. My biggest fear at that moment was that he would hurt her, so I called her over. Once my dog was with me, I ran for the trail. There was no way I could spend the night out there, but it's a hard hike out in the dark, so I was worried about that. Even though I had my flashlight, the trail was so dark that it could be dangerous. Even though the man pulled a knife on me, it seemed that he didn't even chase me. I was hoping that he was just planning to rob my campsite, so I kept walking. I had left most of my stuff back there, including my phone, which was in my tent. However, I did have my wallet and keys in my pocket, so I would be able to drive out once I got to my car. Clancy and I walked quickly, with her leading the way. I had my flashlight out and kept it fixed on the trail. Every minute or so, Clancy would make it out of my sight and I would have to call her back but eventually we made it out to the road. It was creepy being out there at night, and the whole time I was expecting to be ambushed by that crazy guy. We got to the car safely though, and I turned on the engine. I drove home that night, but didn't get there until it was really late. I hardly slept, and in the morning I called the cops. One of the rangers for the area met me at the trailhead so we could go in to get my stuff. When we got to the campsite, surprisingly, it seemed like everything was still there, the only sign that anyone had been there was a small hole melted into the top of my tent. Could have been a cigarette burn, or maybe he just did it with a lighter, I still don't know. I began tearing everything down, and when I was putting my tent away, I realized that my phone was missing. I was sure I had left it in the tent, so I assumed the man had stolen it. Once everything was packed up, I decided to sweep the area to see if my phone was left somewhere. When I combed through the area around the fire pit, I found it, partially buried under some brush. When I picked it up, there was a lot of dirt and debris stuck to it. I cleaned it up as best I could, but it seemed to just smear around the surface of the screen. I looked down at my hands, and I could see red flakes of what seemed to be dried blood. It was covering the phone. 
I turned it on out of instinct, and it seemed fine, with the battery at around 30%. When I poked through it, I found a new video that had been taken the night before. I know I should have given it to the cops, but I was too curious not to check. When it started, the camera was pointing at the fire, which was still going at the time. When it panned around, I saw the man's thin face, then a knife came into frame, and I watched as he dragged it along the top of his forehead. Blood dripped down his face for several seconds, then it must have covered the camera because it all went blank. The camera rolled for another 45 minutes, but all I could see was black after that. I showed it to the ranger, and he took the phone as evidence at that moment. I got it back the next day. Seeing that video added a whole new level of creepiness to the whole thing. That guy was crazy without a doubt, and I'm pretty sure that he would have killed me if I stayed any longer. It's hard to imagine how someone could last very long out there in the woods by themselves with an open wound. Since he was never caught by the police, I can only imagine what happened to him, probably torn apart by wolves. Disturbing as that is, I think that's most likely. When I was 20 years old, I took a spring break trip with 10 fraternity brothers from my college. We went to a Caribbean island. We stayed in a two-star hotel near the beach, and would visit the larger, nicer hotels that were on the beach. We were located near the water, and a little south of a neighborhood that in the 80s and 90s was considered unsafe. One night, I tried to get a cab to get this girl who I had met back to her hotel, which was a couple of miles away. It was late at night, around 2 a.m., and we were unable to get a cab around my hotel. Seemingly out of options, I decided to walk her back. We began by walking along the avenue, which was close to the beach, from my hotel. The avenue was somewhat lively, though calmer in the late hours. From there, we walked across a couple of car and pedestrian causeways to get to our hotel. The walk, while quiet and deserted, was thankfully uneventful. As I headed back on my own, I became more aware of my surroundings. I guess I didn't notice the area much on my walk over. I now observed that many of the buildings in the area were deserted and seemingly uninhabited. I picked up the pace, and probably because of that, I got a little disoriented and made a wrong turn over one of the causeways. Instead of making a right turn, I stayed straight. Thankfully, I realized my error and backtracked a bit to get back to the causeway to my hotel in the beach area. Pretty soon, I saw the lights of the beach area hotels less than a mile away, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I was almost there. At that moment, heading towards me was an old blue station wagon with faded headlights driving fairly slowly. I think it was one of those old Ford station wagons with the wood paneling on the side. As it creeped closer, I noticed the car was riding very low to the ground. The car was full of men who looked to be in their 20s or 30s. There must have been five to eight of them in the vehicle. They were piled in the front row, in the back row, and the rear of the station wagon. They were driving in the right lane slowly, right towards me. As they drove by, I could see that all of them were staring at me, and they certainly saw my terrified face. I'm not a big guy, about five foot nine and skinny, just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I didn't even have my wallet, money, or identification with me, and obviously no cell phone back then. The car passed by slowly, and then out of the corner of my eye, I saw it stop about 60 feet behind me. I gradually turned my head to see the station wagon's rear lights switching from red to white. They were slowly backing up towards me. My heart felt like it was in my mouth. I was poised to take off in a full sprint, but just then, the car stopped. The rear lights switched back to red, and they drove away, and I was able to make it back to my hotel. A week later, I was back at school, having lunch at the fraternity house. One of the fraternity brothers who did not go on the trip was from the Caribbean island we had visited. I related to him where I was walking that night and what happened. His eyes bulged, and he said to me that that was one of the most dangerous places on the island. He said, you have to understand, people don't just get robbed and killed there, they get dismembered. I was working at a fast food place when this happened, and I was still in high school. It was my senior year, but I had just gotten the job a few months ago at the time. I would do the evening shift after school a few times each week, and I would usually have the weekends off. My manager was a friend of my brother's, named Derek, and he was how I got the job. He was five years older, so still a pretty young guy. We got along pretty well, and when we worked together, there were a lot of laughs. On the night in question, I began working after dinner, and I was set to stay until close, which would have been 11pm. 
It was just me and Derek that night, which was fine, because it wasn't that busy after around 8. When I walked in the door, our other co-worker Carrie was just heading out, and Derek was already there. I went behind the counter and jumped right into it, trying to make myself useful. I was the only one on the register, and Derek was in the back. Even though he was the manager, he still did a lot of the same work that the lower level workers did, because there just wasn't that much management stuff. By around 9, there were hardly any customers there. I think there was a single guy sitting in one of the booths near the back entrance, and he was just nursing a drink, probably using the Wi-Fi. I was in the back with Derek when the door opened. I went out to cover the counter in case somebody wanted to place an order while Derek stayed in the back. The guy who walked in was a gruff looking guy, even though he was probably only in his early 20s. He had a light red beard, a ripped black jacket, and smelled strongly of cigarettes. Before I could say anything to him, he asked to talk to Derek, and he asked for him by name, not just the manager. I said sure, and then I went back to get him. As soon as Derek walked out, the guy started screaming at him. It was hard to make out some of it, but one phrase still stands out. He was screaming, you know you effed me, over and over again. I was standing there awkwardly as this was all happening. Then I noticed the man in the far booth stood up, and then he left through the far entrance. At that moment, I was feeling jealous of him, because I really wanted to do the same. After a few agonizing minutes, Derek told the guy to leave and even threatened to call the cops. At that point, he turned around and walked out. I didn't even ask what that was all about, but Derek told me anyway. The guy was a former employee who had worked there before I started. Derek had fired him about a month earlier, he told me. With that, it all made sense. Just a disgruntled former employee. I'm sure things like that happen all the time. So we went back to work, and I didn't press the issue any further. I didn't even ask why he was fired. A few more customers trickled in throughout the evening, but before I knew it, it was close to closing time. Since there wasn't much work to do throughout the night, we were pretty much ready with most things cleaned. As soon as the clock struck 11, I locked the doors. Derek was taking care of the money, and I went to the back to take out what was left of the trash for the night. There was a garbage area at the back of the building that was shared with a few of the other businesses in the complex. The back door would lock automatically, so I would always prop it open with something when I went out there. I grabbed the last bag of trash and walked out the door, then I slid a bucket in to keep it from closing. After I threw the garbage into the dumpster, I headed back towards the building. That was when I was approached from behind. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I jumped from shock. When I turned around, there was a man standing there, and he was wearing a mask over his face. It could have been a balaclava, or maybe just a black t-shirt wrapped around his head. Either way, it was scary, because he clearly didn't want his identity to be known. That being said, he was obviously the angry guy from before. I recognized his posture and the cigarette smell, which was obvious, even though we were outside. He was even wearing the same clothes. I couldn't even squeeze out a single word before the guy pulled a gun on me. Get out of the way, he grumbled. I stepped aside, and the man walked straight towards the door. He walked right into the restaurant through the back door, and I knew Derek was in trouble. There wasn't enough time to call the cops, so I did the only thing I could do. I screamed out, Derek, get out of there. Not the best warning, but it was all I could do. As soon as the words left my lips, I heard two gunshots, and the partially open door in front of me jumped. I didn't realize it at the time, but he actually shot back through the door. I still don't know if he was trying to hit me, scare me, or just punish me for even trying to warn my boss. Right then, I ran through the back alley and made it to one of the other businesses that was next door. There was a liquor store that was still open, and when I walked in, the clerk was already on the phone. He had heard the shots, and he already called the cops. The police got there quickly, and the guy was arrested. My worst fear was that something happened to Derek, but he was fine. He had managed to hide before the guy with the gun found him. He later told me that he saw him coming on the camera just in time. He was really lucky that he was watching at that moment, because my warning might not have been enough. That was the only really scary thing that happened to me at that job. Other than that, there were a few fights and some drunk customers, but no real serious threats. Every time I went into work after that, I couldn't forget how close I came to being shot. If I was standing just 10 or 15 feet over, then I could have been killed. I'm 28 now, but this happened when I was in my early teens. I had just started my first year of high school, and it was September, so it was still kind of like summer outside. Our neighborhood was on the outskirts of town, and it was a half hour bus ride for me to get to school each way. Although our street was pretty much like any other suburban area, you wouldn't have had to go far before it became a pretty rural looking country area. 
There were dirt roads within walking distance, and there were farm fields all over the place. There was also a large gravel pit around there, so there would be huge dump trucks coming and going sometimes. Down the road from the gravel pit was a smaller abandoned pit that we would sometimes use to hang out in. There was a fire pit in there and some logs to sit on. Some of the older kids would use it to party sometimes, so now and then you would find a ton of empty beer cans. We weren't technically supposed to go in there because it was private property, but on weekends and in the evenings, there wasn't usually anybody around who would care. It was a Sunday afternoon in September, and me and my two friends Danny and Sean were riding our bikes around the neighborhood. Danny and Sean were pretty much best friends since grade two, and I didn't start hanging out with them until a few years ago at the time. Because of that, I was kind of the odd one out sometimes. Without going too much into the drama, Sean and I were getting on each other's nerves at the time as well. I don't want to give too much detail, but it is important to the story. We got bored after an hour of biking, so we decided to go for a ride on one of the country roads. When we left our neighborhood, we passed an older truck. Not one of those big dump trucks that I mentioned, just a regular pickup truck. We didn't think much of it at the time, because cars and trucks would pass by often. When we got to that old gravel pit, we pulled over and sat around talking for a while. The place was kind of a mess with trash and beer cans, probably because there was a party the night before or something. After we were in there for about an hour, me and Sean started arguing, and he got pretty mad at me. I was a little mad too, so I decided to leave while the other two stayed in the gravel pit. As I was biking down the road heading home, that truck from before started driving slowly next to me. I stopped to see what he wanted. There was a single man inside, and he looked like just a normal middle-aged man. He had a plaid shirt with short dark hair and a mustache. He was clean shaven otherwise. As soon as the truck came to a stop, he told me that I was trespassing in the gravel pit. I mumbled some excuse and maybe said sorry or something. I thought I was in trouble, but I didn't think it would be a big deal, because everybody did it. It was the first time I had ever been confronted over it though, so it was definitely weird. I was about to get going, but then the man told me to stop. He said that I had to go with him, and that he was going to let my parents know that I had caused trouble. I told him that I couldn't leave my bike, so he told me that I could put it in the back of the truck. Remember, I was 15 at the time, so I wasn't stupid. There was something off about this guy, and I sure wasn't getting into his truck. I got back onto my bike and started pedaling, but then the truck sped up ahead of me, then pulled over diagonally over the shoulder and the side of the road, blocking me. That's when I knew I was in trouble. The man opened the door and got out of the truck, then came around to the side that I was on. As soon as I saw him come around, I could tell that he was holding a knife. With his truck blocking half of the road, I didn't feel that I could make it around him without getting caught, so I turned around and started biking back in the opposite direction. The gravel pit was only 10 minutes in that direction, so I was hoping my friends would still be there. As I was biking, I looked back and saw the man was getting back into his truck. To my relief, just then, I saw Danny and Sean biking towards me on the road. I wasn't feeling safe yet, but there is safety in numbers. With three of us, then we would have been able to fight him off. Once I was close to my friends, I looked back again and saw that the truck was turning around. We pulled over to the side of the road to talk about what happened. I blurted out what happened to me, and then Sean told me their side. He and Danny were still hanging out in the gravel pit, he told me. Then the truck pulled in. The man started telling them that they were trespassing and ordered Danny to come with him. They basically told him to F off, and then he left. That was the end of it for them. Then Sean told me that when the truck left, they saw that he turned towards where I was. That was when they decided to leave and catch up with me, because they thought the guy was creepy. He must have thought we were younger than we were, because none of us was falling for that trick. We had all been taught about stranger danger in school, so we knew better than to get in some stranger's truck. It wasn't any kind of work truck anyway, and it wasn't marked with any sort of company logo, just a plain pickup truck. After we calmed down a bit, the three of us biked home and told our parents about the man that we ran into that day. They did call the cops, but we never heard of him being caught, and that was the only time we saw him as well. My guess is that he moved to another area after what he did to us. He was known in our neighborhood after that, so people would have noticed. That was pretty much the end of it. My friends basically saved my life that day, because there's no way I could have outrun him in that truck. He would have gotten me eventually without those guys, and I have always been very grateful.